All right, welcome to the Delicious Recap Family Matters. I'm John Francois, and who are you? I am AJ Vandertunt. All right, yes. is there anybody that you want to be this week, or are you content with being your lovely, beautiful self? I am content with being my lovely, beautiful self because we've got another interview, and I like to be myself in those. People will call me bipolar or some other thing if I went by something else. No, multiple personalities. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that, that. So I think I know how to pronounce her first name, Laura. And then the last name, is it Schumann? Schumann. Schumann. Okay. Either way, she'll tell us when we officially talk to her in just a second. Yeah, Laura has great stories. She worked at uh, Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank as a tour guide for uh, quite some time. And she was there uh, while Family Matters was still being shot. So she has some great stories about that. Other great stories about God. I mean, George Clooney, Steven Spielberg. I mean, Barbara Streisand, Bob De Niro. I mean, she's met everybody. Anybody I'm leaving out? Oh, my God. Dean Cain. Superman. Yeah, like Dean Cain, one of the 27 Superman actors that exist. Um, and, you know, Laura, currently a Pilates instructor. We'll get to learn about that as well. So let's get to it. It's our interview with Laura. Can you, like, pronounce your name for us? Because I want to make sure we get it correctly. It's a great uh, name. My name is Laura Schunemann. Laura Schunemann. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Laura, uh, the reason why we have you on, you have a history. You worked at Warner Brothers in Burbank for quite some time, correct? Yes. Yes. I started as a tour guide in 1995, right out of college. I moved here from Cincinnati because I hated the weather. <laughs> so <laughs> I missed my ceremony of college because I was starting a job here at, at uh, Warner Brothers as a tour guide. So, I mean, I, look, I'm curious, like, how does one make that leap from Cincinnati to Burbank? How were you able to get the connection to get that job and to just completely change your lifestyle? <laughs> well, it was kind of a fluke. So I am from Cincinnati. I was a Cincinnati Bengals cheerleader. And so I came out here to try out for the Raiderettes at the time. So the Raiders, this was their last year here before they moved to Oakland. So I was trying out for the Raiderettes. My girlfriend who came with me, decided to take a tour at Warner Brothers. I talked to the owner, or he was, Dick Mason was the um, the director of the tour department at the time. And I was telling him how I was looking to move out here because I hate the weather in Ohio. I couldn't handle it anymore. And my mother was a former stewardess for TWA where she traveled the world and lived in LA, New York, Germany, you know, everywhere. So listening to all these stories growing up, I'm like, I gotta get the hell out of Ohio. So I was going to take anything I could get my hands on to. And the tour director then, J uh, Dick Mason, offered me a job. He said, look, I have to send it through human resources. So I'm like, fine. I made the finals for the Raiderettes. So I had to come back in two weeks. And so when I came back in two weeks, I had the interview for tour department, had the finals for the Raiderettes, and got the tour job, did not make the Raiderettes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I got it. So, so how were you feeling when you didn't get that Raider Rest job? Were you bummed or were you kind of like, oh, okay, I guess we're going to go on a new direction? No, no big deal. Because back then, even though I was already a Cincinnati Bengals cheerleader, we didn't really take all that stuff seriously. It was just something to do, something for fun. I was also an Ohio girl. I didn't know how things ran out here. But I found out later that the Raiders practiced in Compton. And I'm like, I'm this little valley, you know, this Ohio Valley girl. I'm like, I I don't want to be at hanging out in Compton. And they would say how the Raiders games were so rough and gangish. I was kind of a good thing. I didn't get it. But at the same time, they moved to Oakland that year anyway. They were flying them up and down. So it was it was a, a kind of a blessing in disguise, I should say, that I didn't make it because I think it would have freaked me out. So, so describe that moving process for me, because I, I mean, I would say Ohio and California. I mean, they're, they're a good deal of miles away from each other. So like you, you probably had to, you know, pack things up, make that long cross country drive or flight or whatever. Well, <laughs> I don't like long drives, so I flew out one way. I just oh. I shipped everything I had when I came back for the um, Raiders tryouts. I made friends with an old Rams cheerleader. So I was staying with her and her husband helped me find an apartment. <laughs> and, you know, it all like happened so fast. I was banking on the fact that I might get that job, even though I had no guarantees yet. So I just started shipping stuff out here. I flew out and landed before my stuff did. So I had oh. nothing <laughs> in the studio apartment and barely any clothes to wear because I shipped them with everything and they were arriving two days after I flew in. And I, I really had no idea what I was doing and taking a chance. 
So uh, the funny thing is, is your first day of work is a major movie studio. So here I am at Warner Brothers. This is June of 1995, where it was still just a little production company. It's not these huge conglomerates they are now. For anybody who doesn't know, can you describe the, the daily responsibilities of a tour guide? What, what do they do? Uh, well, basically at the time, the tour department was brand new. So Dick Mason, who had been doing it for years on a private basis, had been there since Jack Warner. He knew Jack Warner himself. He had met everybody from Betty Davis to Clark Gable to you name it. He'd known them. He had met them. So he was basically this historian at Warner Brothers. And they're like, well, why don't we create a tour off of it? And we were a walking tour and, you know, had little tour carts, but there was no rides or excitement like Universal offers. You know, Universal Studios was like a ride. Ours was behind the scenes. We would take you into the Foley room. We would take you into the sound stages. We would take you into the sound department. You could see how the movies were mixed. You could see how the actual productions were happening because it was a small studio of like 5,000 employees. Each tour we were giving was maybe two or three a day per tour guide. There were only four tour guides and they got to see everything as it was happening and the real effects of what it was happening instead of just a pre-made show like Universal was offering at the time. So they were kind of banking it off of that. So before your first day, do you go through like a class where it's like, okay, here's how to explain people how the movie mixing process works, like something like that? We had to go through a week of training and we had to memorize all the movies that had been done on the back lots during the sound, do, in all the sound stages. Because at the time, all the television shows were um, the TGI Friday shows. So Step by Step, Family Matters, Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Then you had Murphy Brown, Lois and Clark, ER, Friends, you know, uh, and these were all the hit shows going on right now. But this was like their second season. So Friends wasn't big yet. ER was just starting to get big. Murphy Brown was probably the big thing. Drew Carey was just starting. So it was just kind of funny that, you know, everything was just so calm and was blowing up later. So we were basically becoming historians in a week we had there was no script there was just winging it but we had to memorize so much information they would take us out on tours i don't know three times a day for a week just listening and hearing how the other tour guides were uh, compiling information and there wasn't anything that dick mason didn't know because dick mason and dana dillaway had ran it dana was a child actress that had been in you know um giant with elizabeth taylor she had been in some twilight zone episodes you know she was a, a child actress And so we were just learning everything from scratch. I knew nothing about the industry. I knew nothing about television, movies, how anything was made. So it was it was an experience. I learned by the time I finished being a tour guide, I think I did it for two years. I must have known the industry inside and out, how everything was made, how everything was done. Now, of course, it's changed significantly, but it was really a neat learning experience. Wow. You know, so uh, I, not too long ago, uh, Andrew, I don't know if you saw this pop up on Max, if you have the streaming service, but they have the 100 years of Warner Brothers like uh, docuseries. And yes. somehow they were able to get a century of this company's history in like four or five episodes. It was insane. So when you were learning this within a short matter of time, Laura, where you overwhelmed like oh my god so much information i have to learn at once or were you just kind of like eager and like yeah you know i'm an old movie buff so i loved it you know you're hearing the actual stories of what really happened you know dick would tell the stories of mary when he met raquel welch doing a soap uh ad and she was just going to introduce this french bikini during what was that movie million bc and he goes and he said somebody's like you gotta come over here and see this girl over in stage five she's hot (laughs) and so he goes running over there and and he said there's just this gorgeous woman and she was so nice and you know talking about how she was just going to introduce this french bikini or he would tell about movies where i think betty davis had a uh an evil twin in one of these movies and she would call the evil twin which was just a recording recording box, you know, that she'd have to talk back and forth with um, for the movie. She goes, where's the bitch? And she meant the other, you know, her other nemesis in the show, because that's how she would practice is she goes, where's the bitch? <laughs> Which was, uh, her, her cohort was with the recording machine. So and, you know, Dick telling us all the neat stories of Jack Warner and the things that he had done and the things that he had seen and how he ran the studio and how he drove his brother Harry crazy and into an early grave. I mean, it was just really neat to hear all their historical stories of the different actors and actresses of you. There were telegrams I saw of Betty Davis arguing with Jack Warner because they would just work them back to back. This was before SAG existed. And she yeah. would say, 
do, if you see me in a coffin where you realize I am too tired to work, enough is enough, because they would just bounce them from one set to another. Or how he, one of the directors on a, a movie, uh, he hated, uh, no, Jack Warner hated one of the directors on a particular movie. So much so, he pulled Jack, uh, what was his name? Carrie, no, James Cagney, sorry. James mm-hmm. Cagney off of one set, pulled him onto this set because he knew they'd get in so bad of a fight. James Cagney hauled off and socked the director in the face. And then Jack pulled him off and stuck him back on his movie because I got you what I needed out of you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hearing yep. these kind of stories was just really neat. I loved I loved old movies. So hearing that you see them as real people and more. Marlena yeah. Dietrich, Cary Grant, you know, how they shot Casablanca was shot at Warner Brothers in stage eight, which I think is the same stage they did step by step in. And mm-hmm. that's that's what was uh, Rick's Cafe and how they um, shot the entire movie in two weeks and they made up the script as they went along. So if you really pay attention to the movie Casablanca, her name is Ilsa in half the movie and Elsa in the other half of the movie because I couldn't remember what they were calling her. <laughs> I have to watch that back and, and see. That yeah, a- it, it, they were whipping out about 100 movies a year. That was just they were just on a conveyor belt of movies. Now what a movie studio puts out, maybe three or four. Wow. So... so- I mean, okay, so so you know, as as you had mentioned, Family Matters being one of the uh, the, the the products that was filmed at Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, um, and you said you had the ability, like as a tour guide, to like watch rehearsals as you were showing people, like, hey, the, you know, here's where J- Jaleel and Reggie and all these people filmed their rehearsals, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the fun thing about Family Matters was so Rich Carell was one of the main directors of that, which you interviewed. And Joel Zwick was the other one. They would trade back and forth between Step by Step and um, uh, Family Matters. And uh, they were wonderful directors. So they were always like, come on in, see what we do. And we'd hang out in the stands and we'd watch them rehearse. You know, Reginald Val Johnson couldn't have been nicer. Jaleel would come up and talk to them. I even made friends with Jaleel after a while. Every once in a while, I run into him and he's like, Laura! <laughs> Like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I haven't seen him in probably 10 plus years, but you know, it's kind of funny. You, you're just, these were the guys you hung out at the water cooler with, you know? So even when I was in my off hours, when I wasn't having a tour, I would go over to step by step or I would go over to Murphy Brown or family matters. And I'd hang out in the stands and just watch him rehearse. Cause I was fascinated. I was wanted to learn how a four camera system worked. You know, I'd never seen it before. And Rich would just tell me how things worked and we just all hang out. And, you know, they couldn't have been nicer people. You know, I'm, I'm nobody. <laughs> I was just well, kind of well, hanging well, out. Well, well, based on those questions, did you have an interest in taking it further and like wanting to work behind the scenes of a television show or were you content with just asking questions as a tour guide? Well, I was just at the time I was curious. I had uh, my background in college. I had gotten degrees in pre-med or pre-med pre-law. So I was planning on going to law school out here, you know, and I thought I would just work for a while and, and, you know, before I applied to law school. So I wasn't really interested in, in production all that much and um, thought, well, let's see if I can get a paralegal job or I can get a legal secretary job and work my way up the ranks. I was thinking more corporate, not production. Mm -hmm. And um, the funny thing is, is because these are the guys you're hanging out with at the water cooler. Being from Cincinnati, I made friends with George Clooney because, you know, ER is right next door. And I'm, mm-hmm. you know, somebody introduced him to me and I'm like, oh, I'm from Cincinnati. You're Nick Clooney's son. And he goes, well, I haven't heard that in a long time because that's how I see him. And these are the people you hang out with, you know, and he made me promise. Like, I don't know how many years it was after that. He said, promise me you will never become an actress. And I'm like, why? And he said, because it is not what it's cracked up to be. You know, it is hard work. I've got fans hounding me and. And I don't mind it. I don't mind signing autographs. But he goes, I, I never have a moment on my own. And this was probably right after he got Sexiest Man Alive the first time in 97. Everything was a little bit fine until that happened. And then everything just kind of <laughs> went a little nutty. So so didn't didn't George and Jaleel play basketball games like? Oh, it, yeah. George played basketball. He played basketball with me. He didn't care if you were the garbage guy or the, the courier or a tour guy. I'm stuck at basketball. So, you know, it would be one of the things where George is playing basketball. Let's say the um, the guy who collects the garbage around the studio and then he, they would play horse. And he's like, and I would just be, be a prop. He's like, I'm going to bounce it off of Laura. And then the hoop that like they're telling what they're going to do. Because I'm like, that's about as close as I'm going to get to playing basketball. <laughs> I'm awful at it. But yeah, he played with everybody. They had, uh, they, they built a, there was a basketball court by the gym and they had to put a fence up because the balls were kind of running away and, and everybody would just kind of collect and watch George play with whoever, because I think we had suddenly Susan going on. So you would see, um, what's his name? The guy from breakfast club that was on suddenly Susan, his name always escapes me. And he'd have a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and they're playing basketball. (laughs) I was like, really? He's like, I've smoked worse. (laughs) 
<laughs> who was wow. who was the who was the guy who was um Judd, he was Judd, like the bad boy in Breakfast Club? Yeah, 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 yeah. J- Judd something. Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson. Judd Nelson was yeah. And you would see him playing with Jaleel. You would see him playing with whoever was on the basketball court at that time. Dean Kane was always over there playing basketball because he was a big athlete. And at the time, we were also doing um Space Jam. So mm. Space Jam had um built this huge white basketball court like dome like a big tent with a basketball court in there so jordan could practice all the time and i made friends with his trainer so i could get in because nobody was allowed in that tent but i love basketball i met michael jordan charles barkley dennis rodman Jawan howard i mean i was like oh my god you know because they were bringing in all these guys to play just to keep jordan up on his game. He didn't have any downtime. He shot during the day and he was playing basketball at night. And, wow. you know, he's they're bringing in like the UCLA basketball players, anybody he could just play with just to, to keep him going. So since, you have got- all, so, so since you have all this close up access to these wonderful stars on this lot, I wonder if like either the guests that you're tour guiding through or friends of yours are just like, oh, hey, is there any way that I can get a personal connection or an autograph or a conversation with any of these stars that you are in contact with every day? Like, have you ever had any of that? Um, yeah, I mean, I had I had a lot of which I thought was strange. I used to have a lot of women in kind of their middle aged years slipping me notes and fifty dollar bills to give to Dean Kane because he was Superman at the time for Lois and Clark, not Clooney, not. <laughs> and then I would, you know, I'd see Dean and I'm like, uh, here's another one. <laughs> and he was like, really? <laughs> Wait, wait, so it was like $50 to Dean King because he needed it or because no, they no, wanted no. They were giving me the $50 to pass ah. him a note, you know? Yeah. To, and I was like, no offense. He's, <laughs> he doesn't care. I mean, no offense. He, he was thought it was sweet, but he was like, well, what am I supposed to do with it now? <laughs> so it was kind yeah. of weird things like that, that, you know, or or there were times where, you know, we had to prep them. Don't chase after them if you're going to see them, you know, things like that. And one time I remember being on a cart and they were doing the outside part of ER and Juliana Margulies and George Clooney were walking towards us. And I was saying, OK, be cool. Don't go. But George Clooney's walking this way. And I'm actually like pretending I don't, you know, know what's going on and, and doing it. And he they said he was I didn't see it. They said he's looking at you and like laughing and pointing and being silly. I'm like, yeah, well, that's George. <laughs> but, you know, we're trying to get them to be like, don't. Don't, don't freak out if you see anybody. One time I had to go in the friend set and see if the, the stage was free to take the tour in. And I said, OK, they're shooting Father's Day across the street. You might see Billy Crystal. You might see Robin Williams. If you do, do not freak out. <laughs> and so, you know, I went in, I came out. And they're like, you'd be so proud of us. We saw Robin Williams and he talked to us, but we didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> because you'd be surprised these people would see somebody and i i had one girl hyperventilating because she saw george clooney and i said you need to calm down or we're gonna leave <laughs> because this is ridiculous and it, it just it's, and we would joke about it but i'm like i don't get it i have yet as many people as i have worked with over the last i don't know course of my career out here and i have worked with legends and iconic directors and you name it I don't get starstruck. They're just, you know, I, I never understood. But people don't even know how they're going to react when they see them either. Yeah. You know, so it, it's it was just kind of astounding to me. Like, I'm like, I wanted to like poke them and be like, see, just man, <laughs> nothing, nothing new. Yeah. I mean, I would I would imagine this being your day to day after a while. I mean, yeah, you just get to see them as real human beings and not so much celebrities. Um, hey, can, uh, let, let me go back to uh, your time, like observing Family Matters rehearsals. Uh, you mentioned that Rich Corral was very nice with you and, and showing you how things work. Um, I mean, it seems like he's like the most. Uh, prolific and the director that people rarely reference the most in terms of family matters. What, like, what do you think it was about his like specific uh, directing style that made him come back for like 86 episodes? Well, he loved the show, you know, and he really loved doing, he was very picky on the jobs that he took. There were times where he was offered to do friends and he was like, no, <laughs> really? you know, he was like, no, nah, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the reason was. I mean, Rich Carell is still a good friend of mine to this day, but I remember him telling me back then he, they offered, he's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> So, you know, and Friends probably started up, I think, in 94. So it was kind of funny that he was like, I'm good. I like this. And and he likes more that type of comedy, more family. You know, I also worked with Rich Carell when he did Jamie Foxx, you know, and um, I think it's also, you know, 
the fact that Rich's history and his father, you'd know his father is uh, Charles Carell from Amos and Andy, right? So he, Rich seems to understand there's also um, a difference between like black comedy versus white comedy. And I think he really understood how to bring that out. All right. You you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the the certain, you know, genre that they're told it. And Family Matters was just such a cute family oriented, you know, giving the good message. And, you know, this is how family is and how friendship is and how we work. You know, he really liked that. Yeah, I do. I I think, Andrew, I I recall um, Rich saying in our conversation that he just loved the the family friendly vibe. He loved working with kids. And I guess there was just a um, maybe a sort of ego driven adult vibe that friends would have given him if he uh, had decided to take on directing work there. Um, Laura, is there a memorable moment you can th- like think of with uh, your interactions with one of the Family Matters cast members? Any particular questions, any funny stories that you got from either Reggie or Jaleel or Jamie? Like just anything that stands out to you? Well, I mean, um, I used to hang out with Jaleel and Darius every once in a while and we would all just joke around or if, if Rich was having one of those Part, he had these huge Halloween parties and I'd hang out with them because they were all the only people I knew <laughs> were at his parties mm-hmm. were Darius and Jaleel. And, um, but even when I left the tour department, I worked down the street at Hanna-Barbera, you know, I'd come back up and I would hang out on the set. And this was just about the time they were introducing Stefan instead of, you know, Urkel. And I remember thinking, cause you know, you, Jaleel is so different from obviously you know, Urkel. So yeah. now that they were introducing Stefan and I was like, Oh, so they're finally showing you who Jaleel really is. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I remember sitting there on the set in the stands, just watching them, you know, and watching um, Jaleel and Jay. And I was like, wow, you know, cause I'm so used to him being that silly character. It was always like a cartoon character versus who he really was. And seeing him now be Stefan, I was like, well, this is really neat. They finally get to see who Jay really is, that he's just this really neat, sophisticated guy. And he's not Urkel, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I remember telling him afterward, I'm like, Talil, that was really good. I really liked that. You know, you, the, you, you, you really are versatile. And he's like, you know, Laura, that's nice. I really appreciate you seeing that. That means a lot to me. And, you know, it was neat to finally see him be himself so people could to differentiate the, you know, two people that he isn't Steve Urkel, (laughs) you know, and how, how talented he really was to pull off Urkel, even though that's not who he is. Mm. You know, I mean, that's the thing you start seeing when you're, you know, these people in real life, and then you see them as a character, no different than friends, you know, one of the best, two of the best people on there was um, Matt LeBlanc and, um, who plays Phoebe, the girl who plays Phoebe, because they're nothing like their characters. And Lisa I'm like, Kud- if anybody knew Lisa Kudrow, if they anybody knew who they were really like, they'd be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> that shows you how versatile they really are. And yeah. Jay is brilliant, you know, with, with some of the stuff he pulled off. So, wow. yeah. Wow. And... I mean, maybe you already answered this question earlier, but I'm just wondering, because of your experience working at the Warner Brothers lot, uh, did that increase or decrease this sort of like mystique of show business? Because I like how, I mean, you seem to have this balance of like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm a movie nerd, I'm a TV nerd, but at the same time, like you're not, like you said, you're not starstruck. You see these people as regular people who happen to be in this content that you love so much. Well, I think that, I mean, I don't know how to explain this. Being that I watched how these girls reacted to George Clooney so much and the hierarchy of being fame, and I get in these discussions with Jaleel. He had this a lot too. Um, and the friends said people got crazy. Then I'm like, I don't know if I like the whole fame thing. Like, it would be one thing if I was an actor and it was somebody I didn't know, you know, nobody knew. But the whole fame thing scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to be George Clooney. <laughs> You know, and I I remember when I finally got out of the tour department and I went down to Hanna-Barbera and I know, you know who Hanna-Barbera is, right? He created the cartoons and a lot of people don't know who they are anymore. And there was this cute animator who would hang out at my desk. He was one of the big and up and coming um, animators. And and I'm I'm like, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be George Clooney. I'm like being hysterical, telling him he would just look at me with big brown eyes like, oh, my gosh. And then he goes off and creates Family Guy. It was Seth MacFarlane. Wow. So here he was just this animator I worked with where I'm like just divulging. Like, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to get in the middle of it. And here I'm warning him about what he's going to have to deal with later on in life. <laughs> so, you know, you just never knew who your friends are, who you hung out with, who they were going to be later on. 
Oh my God. So, I love that. It, it just kind of killed my, it, I, I always wonder if people knew what they would really be like being that famous, if they would really still want to be an actor. Wow. Andrew, do it's you have a lot of hard work. It is long, long hours. And yeah. You know, even behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, it's like a little too much for me. Wow. I see you've answered a bunch of questions I already had already that <laughs> it's like a small world from what I'm getting. Everybody has this like same interweb of interconnections with people. Yeah. Is there anything that you saw, let's say like on the set of Family Matters or any set where you're like, no way would they ever record this and put this on TV broadcast. And then you were surprised to see it there. Um. No, it was just the opposite. You'd mm -hmm. see some things being filmed and then you're like, well, they're really going to put this on air. <laughs> and no, nope, they didn't. They cut it out or they would do a scene over and over and over and over again. And they finally glitched it or changed it a little bit. And it kind of calmed it down. That was my experience on this wasn't Warner Brothers, but I worked on Desperate Housewives. And, you know, the director was also the executive producer and they would do the scene over and over and over again. And all of a sudden they would tone it down and Marsha Cross would be like, but we just you're not going to knock that out, are you? And, you know, same thing. With Eva Longoria was like, that was it was so much funnier. And they're like, we shot 100 takes. But then when you saw it, saw it, it was out. And you're like, you know what? why are they toning it down? <laughs> you know, it was cute, you know, and uh, Rich was really efficient when he was shooting Family Matters. I mean, he was just like, you know, he could shoot that and get it out in the door in probably a good two and a half, three hours, which is unheard of for shoot night. Mm. Friends would bring in two audiences starting at three o'clock and then they'd have to change the audience, come back because they wanted to try so many lines to see what the different reactions were. And I remember being in the set and we were waiting for them to shut down to have their Christmas party. And we were they were still shooting at midnight. No audience. Wow. You know, the audience, both audiences were gone and it's midnight and we're all just sitting in the stands like, oh, come on, finish this up already. <laughs> and then they just started bringing in all the pool machines and the, you know, the pinball machines to play, you know, to have fun at the Christmas party. But it was just kind of funny. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So mm -hmm. it, it, the dynamic between some of the directors of the different shows. But Rich was one of the best. I mean, he could just roll that thing out like it was nothing. He was incredibly efficient in what he was doing. And, you, you know, Family Matters ran like butter. It was it mm -hmm. was really well done. Murphy Brown was about the same way. You know, mm -hmm. they, they knew what they wanted and they knew how to get it and they went with it. Wow. It made, I think, a lot of them so successful. It's interesting because earlier today, John and I were talking and we were talking about an episode directed by Rich, how it just flowed so smoothly and it went so quickly. When you watch Family Matters, if you've gone back and watched it, can you tell when he's directing an episode compared to somebody else without even looking at like the credits? Um, Sometimes, yes, because... The way a lot of the actors will deliver the lines, uh, it gets a lot, a little bit more reaction. You, you know what I mean? Like you'll get more laughs. Somehow Rich's show's got more laughs than Joel necessarily. Not that it means Joel was any different, but um, it was always funny to watch um, them rehearsing too, because the loudest laugh I'd hear even was just the crew and just, you know, it was Rich. <laughs> you hear, hear his laugh louder than everybody. And there was just something that that drove, I think the actors then realized, oh, maybe if I deliver it this way, it gets a better reaction. You know, and Richie was real, Rich was really picky on how each one of those was delivered. And he, he was, he was so good with the actors in like being genuine with them and just really guiding them. His, his directorial, directorial guidance was really, you know, brilliant. And he, he loved the actors. Like he just really loved who they were and he was one himself. So he knew kind of how to give them critiques and how to kind of guide them. So it was, it was really interesting. You know, sometimes you work on these shows, the directors seem a little above the actors or they look down on them. He didn't, he, he, really admired them. And he was like, you know, you could tell when he was really proud of them. And it was like, they wanted to make him proud. So they would do better. So a lot of times you got a better reaction out of the audience with family matters when he did it rather than Joel, which, you know, you can always be like, oh yeah, Rich did this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is leading into something I have wondered about for the longest time. Are there signs in the stands that say applause, laughter, or anything to cue the no. audience for something? No, there isn't at all they have they do have a warm-up comic that comes out beforehand just to kind of get the audience warmed up and keep them entertained in between takes because there's a lot of downtime but there is no no audience applause sign no nothing and they want it to be natural and if something dies it gives the writers time enough to you know keep it going because the the, the way the sitcom shoot the day before air or shoot day, they'll have all the writers out every day that week and see how the laughs go. But they're only hearing themselves laugh. 
So they're, they're only thinking, well, we find it funny, but what if an audience doesn't find it funny? And if it doesn't right. get the reaction that they want, then they can at least change it real quick and still see how this works, you know, but family matters, they didn't have to do that much with, you know, it, it kind of just flowed on its own. Um, but uh, yeah, no, there are no signs. There are no anybody telling they want their they want their actual reaction to everything. That answers so much for me. Now, were you there the episode that Urkel was filmed? The like the premiere episode for him, episode 12? Oh, no, no. Um, think that might have been before my time. I think that was in early 90s. Because okay. he because if, if I was watching him be Stefan and that was 1997, they it took a while for Stefan to come out. Because I think when he didn't, I mean, I, I remember the episode where they, they brought out, and I think he was only like 13 or 14 when he did that one, wasn't he? And I think yeah. I knew he was already 18 or 19. <laughs> he was in his wow. late teen. So yeah, because we're not that much different in age. So I was like, no, I think Urkel was, his introduction to him was before me. My my experience was his introduction to Stefan. Mm-hmm. So I got to see him him create Stefan, which was, was really neat. So what's often talked about in Family Matters lore is how other cast members have reacted to the uh, fame of Urkel. Because, you know, as you probably already know, like it started as like, oh, we're going to talk about the Winslows. And then Steve Urkel comes in December 15th, 1989. We literally just recapped this episode, Andrew and I, we recorded it earlier. And then it just changes everything. And I wonder uh, with you observing Family Matters rehearsals here and there, did you observe that friction and tension amongst the cast? No, hmm. I, uh, they all got along. They were all like family. Hmm. So I, I've I've never seen it if it happened, but like, you know, I came in 95, this is five or six years later. I was, I'm assuming it probably kind of mellowed out by then. Mm. Um, but you know what, on every set, you're going to have some sort of friction here and there. So, you know, I mean, for whatever the reason there, every set had its moments, you know, we'd hear the behind the scenes stuff going on on ER or most of the time it was Lois and Clark. that was having a little bit of trouble, but you know, other than that, it, it, you know, they're all going to have their, disputes with most of the time it's you know the hour dramas was the long hours and how long is it going to take it's you know rule of hollywood is to hurry up and wait yeah so um but no i never saw any of that friction they just were all like one big family and you said you started in 1990 1995 1995 got it so andrew i can't remember by then i mean had characters like uh rachel and judy already disappeared uh, probably I think by 95, Judy was pretty much phased out and Rachel was gone. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think of just like any uh, past. The only, the only characters I remember are obviously the Winslow parents. Yeah. Um, the sister, the girl who plays Laura. Yeah. And the Darius and Jaleel, you know, those are the ones I knew. Reginald Bell Johnson, you know, all of them. They're the ones I knew the main, the main family. They're the only ones I remember seeing. I wasn't in there all the time, you know, so, but you know, I remember coming in and, and you know, <laughs> just like, oh, here's Laura. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's one of those things, you know, I got a tour and they couldn't have been nicer to the people of the tour and they'd ask, let them ask questions and were just wonderful with them because they, you know, they, they just thought, well, these are our fans, you know, and they really liked it. They liked the interaction with the, the, the fans and the tours, which, you know, that's all we were looking for too. You know, where can we go? Because a lot of places were off, you know, limits. They, some didn't want the tours in there while they were shooting and um, family matters couldn't have been nicer. Step by step couldn't have been nicer about it. So, you know, it was, we could never go into, unfortunately, we could never go into um, hanging with Mr. Cooper. He was one that was, I, I did know Mark Curry very well, but it was when <laughs> I met him off the studio, not on the set. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting how different shows just had their different roles. Cause believe it or not, some of the actors on some of the shows, I don't, it wasn't Mark Curry for sure, but like, uh, there were some actors on, uh, Drew Carey that the, the tours intimidated him. They didn't want an audience. And I'm thinking you're an actress. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want people in here watching you rehearse. <laughs> but you're okay. Well, you know what? I, get it. I mean, I, I I have an acting background, not a professional acting background, but I, I get it. I mean, I think there is a certain um, illusion that you want to maintain with the audience that like, oh, what you see is only the final polished product and rehearsals. Obviously, you're working the kinks out. You're you're, you know, fixing in corrections. So 
I can no, see that. this was certain actors that just got intimidated. They're just shy or whatever, because like Drew Carey was wonderful. If, yeah. if, if it was okay, like we'd go in, like Drew, can we come in? And Drew would be like, yeah, yeah, sure, come in. And one of those actresses is like, no. And he's like, okay, no, 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 now's not a good time. <laughs> so <laughs> you'd be like one of these things, you know, he's all like, come on in. And they're like, no. And he's like, so maybe it was a, you know, particular thing or something going on that day. But um, yeah, it was just kind of funny. But I'm thinking, uh, you know, I grew up on a stage. I did a lot of theater acting, you know, typically they're hands. So I just assumed. <laughs> Everybody's mm-hmm. Miss Piggy. They'd be happy. Come on in. You know, join <laughs> us. So, <laughs> and, I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about Jaleel playing Stefan and how great he was at that. I mean, it wasn't his only character. He played, a, it, it seemed like a bunch of, you know, yeah. a collection of characters on the show. Uh, what were your, did, did you have any reaction to to those? The Southern Bell cousin, the the karate chopping guy. I mean, he, well, he yeah, was- but those were, but they, they all seem, you know, it was one of those things. Yeah. With all those characters that Jaleel did. Mm-hmm. Those were still other characters, you mm-hmm. know, so my brain was differentiating, you know, it's another Urkel, it's another Southern Bell character, you know what I mean? Like he's very versatile, but Stefan was him, mm. you know, and being that I knew him, you know, is all those other ones were like cartoon characters to me rather mm. than knowing Jaleel. I'm like, oh, he finally gets to, that's why it stuck out in my head watching that rehearsal. You know, I wasn't really watching television once it aired anymore because I'm watching so much behind the scenes stuff. I wasn't interested in TV anymore. So I never really saw a lot of the finished products. So my only exposure at the time to Stefan was being there. Now, I do remember watching the episodes where he was those other characters, but they were still another just, you know, silly character he was creating. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that's what I mean. When you're when you watch a lot of them performing and there being these other people and you know what they're like in real life, it's kind of hard to watch them be somebody else. It kind of messes with Ed a little bit. You know, knowing George the way I know, he was a lot like Doug Ross in ER. So there wasn't really much difference between that. But my first movie I saw him in was um, From Dusk Till Dawn, you know, and that's completely different than what I'm used to. And I remember it messing with my head going because he's playing a bad guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> George is a goofball, you know, so it's it, it really throws you even today to see Seth MacFarlane in some of his shows like Orville or something. And I'm like, you know, that's not him. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's it just kind of messes. So that's why I liked you know, the fact that they had brought out Stefan. I don't know why it took him so long, but it was nice to see Jaleel be himself and be like, yeah, I am actually a real person, not one of these, you know, goofy characters. But it just shows you how versatile he is, all those different characters he played. Man's a genius. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he is. I agree. So as so as you've seen many TV shows and movies come and go in that lot, when, when they go and you've, you know, formed these bonds with the cast members and crew involved, is there sort of like, you know, an emotional attachment to, to it where it's like, oh, my God, you're like, you know, it's it's kind of like more a morning process or is it just another day at work where it's like, oh, you know, no, and- it, it is. I remember having to say goodbye, like to Dean Kane just before I left for um, Hanna-Barbera because, you know, Lois and Clark just got killed canceled. And here I was friends with a lot of people on that set, whether it was wardrobe, you know, or, you know, the set guys or Dean or, you know, um, it was just kind of sad to see them go. No different than, you know, when you were at school saying goodbye to your friends or if you leave a job saying goodbye. I remember going to the rap party for a lot of the shows after they were done and having to say goodbye to my friends. And they were guys in the crew, like when Sisters was there with Seal Award. And so it was just kind of like, bittersweet because you these guys live in an ivory tower so it's one thing when you got to see and hanging out on a studio because they were the guys at the water cooler but now that in real life you never see them again yeah and and, and, and the hard part it, it is and in your entire time at warner brothers were you always a tour guide or did you do other positions as well oh no i i um i only did the tour guide for the first two years then i was hannah barbera i had some legal secretary jobs where i was doing the contracts for different feature animation and the studios um the last big job I had there, I worked with Theatrical Legal, where I did the contracts for the movies. And we were working with Warner Independent Pictures. So we had to do the premieres for the big movies that we did. And um, that, but that was probably the last big job I had there. Wow. So uh, what, uh, it seems like you left all things show business related in 2012. Do I have that correct? Or yeah, did we- yeah, yeah. I left it all. <laughs> Why did you decide to leave? Well, it was hard keeping a job. 
they, they, the, the studios started becoming these huge corporations. So it was layoff after layoff after layoff. We're merging this one. We're merging that one. That's how I lost Hanna-Barbera because they were merging into Cartoon Network and they were merging all of Warner Brothers and Hanna-Barbera and all the areas into Sherman Oaks. Then I worked for Warner Brothers Feature Animation, lost the job the same way. You get laid off because they're merging into this section, you know, and they constantly are threatening. So I even left studios. I went over to Disney after I left Warner Brothers in 2010 and Two years later, they were same thing. Well, we might be laying off again. I'm like, you know, I'm a little tired of this. <laughs> I have been through so many jobs, you know, and no leaving no fault of my own, but because they were just constantly repositioning, recreating, you know, nobody is special and everybody's replaceable. So I went into business on my own because so I figured, okay, nobody can fire me now. <laughs> nobody can lay me off. I was just thinking that, like, I've noticed the jobs that you said you, you've worked and you've done these things, but there's always this changing environment. Mm-hmm. Is it still like that now? Or would you say it's even worse? Or is there even a way for somebody to come in and have a position in Hollywood without having security? Uh, I don't know. I, it's got to be a lot harder. And everybody started the same way. Like I said, back in those days, we were just tour guides making $8.50 an hour. Every single one of us had bachelor's and master's degrees, you know, Mm -hmm. trying to make our break into the industry, whatever it was. A lot of them were writers, screenwriters wanting to be or producers, wannabes, you know, and a lot of the guys worked in the mail room and a lot of the actors were helping some of them get their starts too. Um, you know, so it, it's just, it's just interesting. It's who, who you knew. And if you wanted to work it, I was never into networking to be an actress or a producer or anything. So to me, these guys were just friends that I hung out with. Um, the only thing I ever asked for was I asked George Clooney once to, to autograph one of his magazines for me because it was my friend's birthday and she had a huge crush on him. So I'm like, okay, George, do you mind? And he goes, oh no, <laughs> but that's about the only thing I think I ever asked for. So, you know, it was just, uh, it was some of the best days of my life, though, getting to do that and getting to see everything. I mean, people only dream about that. And I got to experience it on a daily basis. Like it was just a day at another day at work. I want I want to know uh, what are the demographics like in Burbank? Like, because anytime I think of Burbank, I, I love watching old Johnny Carson clips. And when he first mm-hmm. moved out to to Burbank to do the Tonight Show back in the 70s, he would always joke about how there are so many old people in Burbank. And it's just yeah. and it seems to not be that today. But I don't know, from your perspective, living there, like what are <laughs> well, what, what, the culture like there? Well, the funny thing is it all started from laughing. Did you ever see laughing back in I the day of the 60s? Okay. So Mm -hmm. remember Gary, Gary Owens, you know, here in beautiful downtown Burbank, I did get to know Gary. His son, Chris is a good friend of mine who works at Warner brothers to this day. And, um, you know, the joke was because my, my mother had lived here back in the day. Cause I remember us watching laughing, you know, repeats later on in life. I said, why do they keep saying that? Why do they keep saying beautiful downtown Burbank? And same as Carson. She's cause I love Johnny Carson. And she goes, because there's nothing in Burbank. (laughs) And she goes, there's nothing. It's just movie studios. That's it. So in those days they were making fun of it. It was not built up. It was not, it was literally nothing like, you know, NBC, which is not there anymore. I mean, the state. Stages are still there, but they're owned by Warner Brothers now and NBC moved to Universal. So that is where Johnny Carson, I'm, it's right down the street from me. So that's where they did um, Johnny Carson. That's where they did laugh in. That's where they did, you know, Jay Leno. And, you know, they, they did a lot of these um, shows. And, and I remember the very first time I came to Burbank on my way to Warner Brothers, I'm like, my God, there's nothing here. <laughs> like I would never live here. <laughs> And here, I've lived here now for 25 years. They have built it up significantly since then because now in Los Angeles, the closer you are to movie studios geographically, the more desirable those living areas are. So it is really expensive now to live in Burbank, Studio City, Valley Village, (laughs) because the studios now conglomerate a lot of those uh, crew members and actors and things like that. So they want to stay near the studios. So now it's maybe just like Park Place Avenue. So So it has built up significantly. (laughs) Yeah. So so I guess the logical question, um, and this might be too deep and historical, like if Burbank has nothing in it, then how was it a desire for all these big movie studios and television studios? Like what made all these big time executives say, okay, we got to go here to build our studios? For that reason, exactly. There's nothing here. So they had the room to expand. 
if you want to buy your dream house, are you going to take somebody else's dream house down and put it with all these other houses around it? Or are you going to take this beautiful location that has nothing around it that you can spread out as much as you want and build this huge, massive studio? So is, is it still literally like that nowadays where the only thing that it has going for it is TV and movie studios? I mean, there's got to be a nightlife or culture or something. Yes, there is now, but there wasn't then because the, the studios brought in the people so like mm-hmm. I said, it's become a desirable place to live because you want to live close to work. It's the reason I live where I live. I want to be close to studios because I worked down the street. I didn't want to be, you know, you don't want to drive in because the traffic is crap out here. <laughs> so everybody wants to just get closer to work or they come up here. We had a time where you'd see um, RVs and stuff on the sides of the studios where these are executives living in those during the week and then going back home to Santa Barbara, San Diego or right up for the weekend. <laughs> so uh, it's my- not unusual. It's, you know, So, yeah, it is built up. I wouldn't say there's a nightlife in Burbank, (laughs) but we only we're like a hop, skip and a jump to Hollywood. So the nice thing about Burbank is you are literally 10, 15 minutes away from anything. Mm. Hollywood, Beverly Hills, you know, West Hollywood, North Hollywood is only literally a 15, 10, 15 minute drive. We're surrounded by them. So Universal is down the street. I am in the vicinity of probably five major movie studios. And wow. at the time when they started, they were nothing. Universal was a 450 acre chicken ranch. Warner Brothers Studio was a pig farmer, I think, or another chicken ranch. <laughs> so they were just ranches, you know, and they just conglomerated them into these big movie studios because the weather is perfect. You don't have to worry about, you know, snow. You don't have to worry about rain all that much. That's why Hollywood became here because our weather was predictable. So here, we'll just start making these movie studios studios and these movie studios have been here since the turn of the 20th century Mm. and have just didn't start conglomerating to these big corporations until the 90s yeah Yeah. all the way up there they really kept them small and but once you know everything changed i think in the 50s when they started going on location like century city used to be fox studios and now it's Mm. a whole huge conglomerate corporate studio uh, city but fox is like on a corner of it Mm. All of Culver City, once upon a time, was MGM Studios. Now it's Sony Studios, but it's the city is huge compared to the studios aren't that big anymore. They just sold off all the back lot. Wow. So Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Universe are still the same original acreage they were when they started. Paramount kind of absorbed RKO. That's all that's left is a big globe on the corner of <laughs> uh, Paramount Studios. So I wonder if you're like, you know, because I know you still enjoy like, you know, consuming TV shows and movies. But when you're watching, do you tend to watch it with a more technical point of view? Like, oh, yeah, that sounds that looks that that outdoor scene looks like it was filmed at this Warner Brothers soundstage or this Universal soundstage rather than just like simply take it in as a regular consumer. Yep, I can I can typically pick out the back lots. The back lots are easier, but a lot of the Universal ones and Warner Brothers are a little similar. Um, Being that I've been on every major movie studio, including Fox and Universal now and knowing what they look like, I go back and watch my old movies. Like my favorite movie is Laura, which was made in 1944, Jean Tierney, you know, Dana Andrews and her apartment. I've been in front of her apartment is still there as 1944 when they shot that movie. And, you know, I was standing in front of it. I, I haven't been on Fox very much, but those were all Fox movies and they did everything on the studio in those days. You know, uh, Prince was one of my other big time, all time favorites. If you look at his uh, the album cover of 1999 or Purple Rain, Purple mm-hmm. Rain, um, he's on his motorcycle on Hennessy Street at Warner Brothers. Hmm. Oh. So, you know, it, it's stuff like that that you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I, I, we see it all the time. Um, another one of my favorites is uh, Christmas in Connecticut with um uh, Barbara Stanwyck. And, um, you know, when they're coming on the horse and carriage, you know, thing, you can tell that's all inside of a soundstage. (laughs) There is nothing outside (laughs) because they had to create Christmas in July, you know, so it's all snow and stuff. It's all inside of a soundstage. Um, my other favorite movie, my fair lady was all done at Warner brothers, all of it inside of a soundstage. Even the horse racing scene was done in stage 18, where they just opened up both elephant doors and let the horses run through for the horse race scene. So, you know, things like that, you learn, you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that, that that's pretty intense, you know? So uh, yeah, I wouldn't have thought that. I mean, there was a fraction of maybe My Fair Lady on Hennessy Street, which is still there. A lot of the back lots have come down at Warner Brothers, which is kind of heartbreaking, but um, I still, I took a lot of pictures of them. So I still have them. And my friends there are still probably historians for the tour departments. So they're like, do you got any pictures of that stuff? We don't have any. I'm like, yeah, somewhere I've got it. I've got my pictures of myself in the Batmobile. The actual Batmobile helps to no Batman. 
<laughs> nobody was allowed in the sound stages at all. And George was like, come on, you want to come in? You want to see that? And I would get to sit there and watch him film. And he'd let me get in the Batmobile. He'd show me the bike. And those things were, you know, those Batmobiles are expensive. <laughs> those are real cars. I was like, you mean this is a real car? <laughs> <laughs> it's a million dollar car and this was what 1996 i think mm-hmm. yeah it, it i was amazed those cars really did almost everything you saw it do in the movie so wow. i was like that's that's it's just for a movie that's the part that astounded me like the things they would do to stuff you know just for a movie yeah poor oh lois and clark demolishing cars and turning them upside down because you know superman if he picks up you know something you know there and the crew guys the night before would be like it's such a nice car they were like giving it a morning sarah you know like a, a funeral <laughs> oh, <laughs> the no. next day they're gonna have to t- pick it up and drop it on its you know head so <laughs> and i'm like you guys are giving it a funeral it's a car <laughs> this is such a nice car look there's nothing wrong with it we just have to turn it upside down and drop it on its head tomorrow <laughs> so it was really kind of funny the stuff you saw that you know I, I i wouldn't have you know the things you th- thought you knew beforehand before you learned about how all this stuff was made mm-hmm. it does kind of disillusion you a little bit like i can never watch a movie or a television show the same way again because it's like you know going to see a magician's act once you know how he does all the tricks it kind of takes some of the fun away from it well i know how he did that oh i know how he did that you know yeah and, and I'm like, so I really don't watch much television or movies anymore. I still go to see movies, but to me, not so much anymore. Mm. It's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, you grew up in your parents' house. You kind of go back going, oh, <laughs> 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 you know, but I do still like the old classics. I, I still go back and watch like m- my favorite TV shows are like when I was a kid, of course, like Love Boat or Heart to Heart or WKRP in Cincinnati, you know, things like that. But well, um, yeah, yeah, because that's before you worked in the business and you and mm-hmm. you and that illusion broke. Yeah. So, well, I wanted to ask you about your Pilates instructing, your Reiki healings. And how did you get into that realm coming from the movie, movie industry? What was like your driving force to get into health and wellness in that spectrum? Um, well, it was actually my last job at Warner Brothers uh, being a, you know, paralegal. And one of the attorneys back in 99 had talked me out of going to uh, law school um, because she was an African-American uh, woman. And she's like, don't waste your time. And she went to Duke and Harvard. And I'm thinking, if she's telling me not to do it, <laughs> she knows what she's talking about, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like, it's not worth it. You'll just waste. So I'm like, okay, so now what do I do with my life? And I'm working as a paralegal at uh, Warner Brothers. And you start making the list of what do I want out of the job instead of trying to find another job? Because now things were starting to change and I knew, you know, things were going to get rougher. They're starting to pile up work on us and changing that we're having two attorneys to work for instead of one, blah, blah, blah. So I started thinking, well, I want to help people. I want to make my own hours. I don't want to work in the corporate industry anymore. And being that I used to be a dancer, hence the reason I used to be an NFL cheerleader. Well, why don't I try this? And I had been doing Pilates and I loved it and I hate working out and Pilates doesn't feel like you're working out. So I was like, well, I'll try this. And then I thought I could at least do it in the same time as I work. So I could have a full-time job and do this on the side. And it eventually took over. So I actually make more money in half the amount of time being a Pilates instructor than I did being a corporate paralegal at Warner Brothers. (laughs) So I'm like, well, obviously this is a better choice. So, yeah. Now, were any of the experiences that you went through being there, just working in like such a high stress environment, is that why you went to a focus on healing being something that made you happy? Yeah, it's much. Well, when you work in law, you're telling everybody what they can't do. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. You know, I, I still pick that out in shows like, oh, they paid for that. They paid for that, you know, because you're seeing all the clearances. You know, I know they can't use their product liability and things like that. So here I'm helping people. I'm healing people because most people that are taking Pilates that can afford it are usually older, can't do very much. Uh I'm dealing with people with hip replacements, shoulder replacements, you know, um, osteoporosis and everything. So watching them, I mean, my clients, my oldest clients, 91 years old, you know, so I'm trying to, I'm healing people. I'm watching them change overnight. And that is much more gratifying than telling a bunch of people what they can't do (laughs) and putting in their contracts and seeing what you can negotiate, you know, is is not as rewarding. So this is much more rewarding. Okay. Now, for somebody who wants to get into Pilates, myself, I want to learn, I want to try more. What would you say to somebody who's interested but hasn't actually made the jump to try going to a first class or what to expect when you go to a first class? Um, The first thing I tell people is to make sure you take reformer Pilates first. Do not go straight into mat Pilates. You could hurt yourself. Uh, Pilates itself is hard. And you don't 
probably don't want to go into a class first. You want to at least have some instruction one-on-one. So anybody who's coming to me that wants to take Pilates, I give them, just give me three privates one-on-one, and then you can see how you feel with it afterward. It's not necessarily for everybody, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, then you, at least you can get an idea. Um, because it's a, it's a, it's a lot to take in at first because it's the, the reformer machines are kind of like a safety net. If you've ever seen acrobats training to, they have those belts around them and they're bouncing around and it catches them if they fall. That's kind mm-hmm. of what a reformer does. So it teaches you how to use your body properly, but it's a lot for some people to take in. I saw people I've been training for years and it's like their first session every time. And they're like, this is why I do this one-on-one. <laughs> they're like, I could never do a class. And I'm like, that's fine as long as you're happy with it. And, um, but I've seen them get strong really fast which is the goal you get, you see more results faster than you do doing anything else. Ah, Now the Reiki healing that you do, is that a part of the Pilates or is that a separate function to get people to a different place? Well, Reiki is um, more of an energy healing, but it also is like a, I call it, um, how do you say this? Like a, a, a body telepathy. So mm-hmm. being that I, I know Reiki, if, if people are having situations, I can actually feel off of them what they're going through. So I can tell them how to adjust themselves. I can feel their shoulder up in their ear. I can feel you, okay, you're in your back. You're not in your core. How do you know that? I'm like, I just, just don't ask. I can't. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it does help. And bodies have terrible poker faces. So of course they show you everything. Um, but it, it's interesting to, and sometimes when my clients are just having a bad day, I give them some Reiki and I'm like, you know what? Go home sleep it off. You're, you're, you're too stressed out. You're too this, you're too that. And it helps me kind of get them to calm down. Reiki is more just, it kind of calms you down and it, it can, um, corner ground you a little bit more, but it's very, uh, even people who don't believe in it or whatever. I'm like, look, the worst case scenario, you fall asleep. (laughs) If I'm doing a Reiki (laughs) session on somebody, I'm like, that's the worst thing's going to happen. And you'll feel really relaxed the next day. (laughs) So even if you don't like it, it's at least a good thing out of it. Look, that sounds positive. I would go Mm -hmm. for it. Where you are now, just geographically, being in Burbank, do you find that the group of people that use your services that come to you are people who come from the entertainment industry or some kind of entertainment background to heal and kind of discover themselves? Um, Well, I teach mostly in Pasadena, which is a hop, skip and a jump from me. Um, and it's mostly retired. So, okay. um, everybody's from all walks of life. Some people have been here for their whole life or they're from somewhere else. Or, um, I had more in the entertainment industry closer, probably when I started, but not so much anymore. They're more young and hip and trying to get themselves. The industry's changed a lot now. So the, the, a lot of the, um, the actors just starting out and these younger, uh, they're having a hard time. It is not what it used to be. You know, you're, the actors aren't making as much. Residuals are completely different on you, sir. You saw the SAG strike. You know, I, I have a lot of friends that are showrunners and TV writers and things like, and they were telling me what was really going on because they've changed it so much now. Hopefully it'll be getting better. But, you know, back in those days when they were doing Family Matters and those, you were set for the year. You were working nine months out of the year. You only had a couple months off and then you start up again. Now they're streaming services. You shoot six episodes and you don't know if it's going to get renewed. And if it's renewed, it could be another four years. You don't know. <laughs> then what are you going to do? Because all your actors are somewhere else, you know, doing other things. They can't, you know, so it's it's changed drastically than what it used to be. Wow. OK, just my last thing that I have for you, because you've given me tons of knowledge throughout this talk. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, is there anything, anything that has happened in your experience of seeing Hollywood backstage as the sets, the stars, anybody that you would want to share with us that you've never told anyone? I'm, I, the, the, I don't know if I haven't ever told anyone, but one of the, my favorite stories that I tell people that I, I tell them at the end was this was just a, it was a cute interaction. And being that these people's reputations did not come over what I met them as. And I was working on a movie set and I was working as a background extra. And all of a sudden this little guy comes next to me and I'm in stiletto heels. So I'm really tall. And he's just this little guy. And he goes, excuse me, dear, my name's Dusty. What's yours? And I said, I'm Laura. And he goes, Dusty, or he goes, Laura, I'd like you to introduce you to my friends, Barbara and Bob. She really likes your hair. How did you do it? 
And so then I was went to take it out because it was just a, a fake scrungy or something. And the camera's guy's like, no, wait until the scene is over. Let's take the shot first. And we all go back to our spots. And I um, we finish our scene. And I'm like, I am not bothering her again. So I'm just going to walk out of the soundstage. She follows me out of the soundstage. And it's like, I really like what you did with your hair. I, you know, how did you do it? So I sat there and talked to her. And she was just this little woman. And she looked at me like she was scared to death of me, like I was going to eat her. <laughs> She's like, uh, and I and she goes, did you get this to like Barney's or something? I'm like, oh no, I got this at Home Shopping Network. <laughs> You know, and we're laughing about it. And and she couldn't have been nicer, sweetest woman in the world. That was Dustin Hoffman introducing me to Barbara Streisand and Bob De Niro. Oh my gosh. So we were working what on Meet this? the Fockers. What year? Huh? What year was, was this? Probably this was Meet the Fockers. They were doing pickup shots at Universal. So it was the end scene when he comes in at the end through the 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 it's like the guess the wedding reception or something. He goes, How's my brother from another mother? to Bob De Niro. And I was just kind of like, so it was one of those things that kind of happened, you know, and everybody always says how Barbara Streisand's afraid of people. You know, she, they, they make her nervous. So she did look at me like I was the one-eyed purple people eater, you know, but I was kind of like, and yes, I'm a huge fan of Barbara Streisand, but I'm like, oh no. And we were just joking around. She started laughing that I'm like, oh, she's not so bad. <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that, you know, where you're just like, you know, everybody has their own stories about who's what, when, where, you know, um, but so most of the people I've dealt with couldn't have been nicer, you know, now everybody's got their attitudes and some people are having a bad day. That's fine. But most of the time, everybody's really nice. I love that. Well, Laura, thank you so much for your time. I mean, um, and how can people find you if they want to just uh, ask you questions or, or you know, be take advantage of your Pilates instructing. How, where, where can people find you? Oh, well, um, I'm on Instagram. So it does have my uh, site for my website and they can always just contact me that way or on Instagram. Yeah, tell, tell everybody how to find you, like, you know, the spelling and everything. I'm, I'm at Laura Schoenemann 22 on Instagram. My uh, website is virtualhealingpilates.com. Awesome, awesome. And I think you had mentioned that you were really nervous about this, and I could not get any nerves at all from you. You're, you're, you're such a great speaker. Oh, thank you. I was just a little worried because it had been so long ago if I could remember <laughs> anything from Family Matters because, you know, there was so much stuff going on everywhere back then. So I was always like, oh, no, I hope I, they can not bored with what I have knowledge I have. <laughs> no, not at all. No, no. I mean, you, you shared a lot of fantastic stories and, and we, we cannot wait to post this when, when we do. So thank you so much. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm glad you guys liked it. Like I said, I was a little worried because I'm like, I I've seen a <laughs> lot and it, it it's really was just an incredible experience. I mean, working on different sets and seeing different things going back and forth. I mean, I've, I, I not many people can say that I've worked with Steven Spielberg. I've worked with Barbara mm -hmm. Streisand. I've worked with Sting. I've worked, you know, Janet Jackson. So, you know, it's everybody's like, <laughs> I'm like, yep. Another day in Hollywood. Thank you again. And and we'll stay in touch. And, and hopefully you have a great rest of your day. Oh, thank you. You guys, too. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, Laura. <laughs> yes, it was. Thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Oh, God. So how was that? That was pretty good. That was a pretty good, amazing conversation. I like to hear all this background knowledge that we don't know about Hollywood. So I'm going to keep prying. Yeah, we've been so uh, blessed to have guests that have just stories and stories and stories. And um, yeah, she she had plenty. She she spent time in literally show business history for, I don't know, I think she said she was there from 95 to 2012, so almost uh, 20 years. So yeah, I, I am so excited to have her on and we'll post all the pictures we can from her time at Warner Brothers Studios uh, on our socials at Family Matters Rewatch Pod, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Threads. You can find us there. You can email us questions, comments, concerns, feedback, the delicious recap at gmail.com. And Andrew, sign us off, please. Um, yes, this was amazing. And we have to get one of these people to say it to let deliciousness ring. Deliciousness <laughs> ring. I keep biting my tongue today. <laughs>